There we go. Thank you, Robot Lady, as Boris often says at the beginning of these. All right, so uh, welcome to the Tools for Thought Interchange. This is a group of people that are interested in digital gardens, second brains, tools for thought, different, all these labels that we're tossing around, around basically using computers to help us to think better and to specifically to think better together. So there are people here that actually have built tools for thought. Um, I see a couple of names out there of folks that are actually working on their own tools. There's a lot of people that are just tool users that are knowledge workers um, and that use those tools regularly as part of their daily lives and workflows. Um, and so this is an opportunity for us to exchange ideas around tips, technique, usage. But a, a particular focus for this time is also to talk about, to drive the interoperability of Tools for Thought. Um, because so much of the way that we use our Tools for Thought can be, um, uh, there's different phases of thinking and we need to be able to use these different tools in different places, but oftentimes they operate in these crazy silos from one another. So um that's this group uh, first off before we get started uh going through these links i just want to say thank you to boris and the vision codes team um they have been so kind to let us use some of their infrastructure including this zoom link um their discord and some other stuff uh so and boris and the vision team kind of uh pioneered this several months ago um and started it off so thanks to you guys for um, having the foresight to see that something like this was necessary and being willing to invest in it. And go check out fission.codes to kind of see some of the stuff that Boris and his group are working on. Um, so some real quick links that might be helpful. We we currently use Luma um, for our community stuff. There's like a, a discussion panel in there, but we mainly use it for event and event registration as well as to um, send emails to like let you know of upcoming events um, and things like that. Also after this event to the Luma uh, forum will post um, slides and notes from this particular uh, event so you can kind of have like the digest of what happened. Um, we do have a discord or, or a channel within the vision discord if you wanted to chat with us in real time. Um, so there's a tools for thought channel in the vision discord you can join that at vision.code slash discord. Um, we also have a, a YouTube account where we're putting past event recordings. So this event will wind up on that YouTube account um, and you can see last month's events there as well. Um, and then um, we currently do have a GitHub account set up right now. We've been using that for like posting the chat logs from the Zoom chat. Um, the Zoom chats for this event have been very vibrant. Um, and so there's lots of people already, you can see people throwing out, a, you know, I think this tool might be interesting for this group and that kind of stuff. So we wanna capture those links somewhere currently capture those, store those in GitHub if you want to go check those out. Um, the main thing we do right now, though, is we have a speaker series, which is what we're doing today, um, where we uh, get together once a month to talk about stuff, have uh, speakers who want to talk about a particular topic. Um, today, it's going to be Jeff and Jared. Um, right now, we've been, uh, mostly they've been in American morning time, but our September event will actually be in a evening time that is more uh, comfortable for Asia, Australia time zones. Um, we have Weiwei from MakeSpace, from the MakeSpace team is going to be talking uh, in September, as well as we're looking for one other uh, speaker during that time slot. So I'll announce that dates for that event and the speaker for that event, um, or the speakers for that event uh, shortly, probably within a week or so. Um, great. So here we go. Then the uh, We've already talked a little bit about the format. The talks will be about 20 minutes long. Jeff, Jared, try to keep it to like 20 minutes-ish and that'll allow 10 plus minutes or so for Q&A. Um, so feel free to like uh, be throwing your questions and chat in the Zoom chat. We usually have a pretty vibrant sort of side channel going on during the chat. Um, and I'll try or Boris will try in case Jared and, and Jeff aren't actually watching the chat while they're speaking, which can be pretty distracting. We'll try to like bring some of those questions back up or call on those folks to ask. Because this is a fairly small group, we'll we'll probably just allow you to unmute and ask your question directly. You don't have to like go through us. Um, but if you'll raise your hand using the Zoom interface at the end of the at the end of the uh, uh, talk or using chat to say, hey, I have a question, um, Boris or I will try to call on you and make space for you to ask your question. Um, so that's basically it. Um, I'm, I'll do really brief introductions of the speakers and let them to give them more time for, uh, speaking and Q and A, since that's what we're, we're here for. Um, Boris, anything to add to that? I know I, I hustled through that pretty quick. 
No, that's perfect. I just dropped in that uh, we have the toolsforthought.rocks domain that redirects to the community that's easier to use. Nice. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, has, has good stuff in there. Cool. I totally forgot about that. All right. So our first speaker today is Jeffrey Litt. Um, you can see his info on the screen right now. So Jeff is currently a PhD student in computer science at MIT. Um, but before becoming a PhD student, he'd done he'd been doing software development in industry and done the startup thing. And so he had quite a bit of like applied experience working with software before moving more into uh, a space uh, or, the, or a research and development space. He's done some work with Ink and Switch, if you've heard of those guys, investigating things like local first software, looking at data schema compatibility. You may have heard of his like Cambria project that he helped out with. Um, and today he's going to be talking about interop and some stuff. So I'm not even sure exactly what, but it'll be fun. And uh, look forward to letting you get started. Take it away, Jeff. Awesome. Thanks for that intro. Um, let me share my screen. All right. Can you all see that? Perfect. So yeah, um, thanks for that intro. Hi, everyone. Great to see so many people here. Um, you know, I am doing a PhD and my, my rough mission is to try to figure out how we can make computer, computing a more empowering thing for regular people. And by that, I mean, not only like programming, but just um, being able to compose tools that we use and fit them together, being able to pick the tools that we use on a daily basis, all that sort of thing. Um, and thinking through that problem has really led me to this belief that there is this missing piece in the way that computing is organized today. And today I wanna to tell you about what I think that missing piece is, um, what uh, the gap is that's there, what it would look like to fill it. Um, I'm not here to pitch you on a specific solution, uh, but I hope to leave you incredibly unsatisfied with the way things are. And hopefully we all can figure out what the heck we're gonna, we're gonna do about it. Um, and yeah, I think, if uh, people want to get questions in during the talk too, I'm fine with that. So if there's things that come up, uh, maybe Boris or Jess, if you see things in the chat that you'd want to just like pause the talk, I'm totally cool with that too. I think it's fun if it feels a little bit more like we're all um, having a discussion. Okay, let's dive in. So I want to start with uh, this story about this app that I use called Craft. Um, it is a note-taking app. It kind of feels a bit like Notion, but it's a native app for um, started out on iOS, um, and then they now have a Mac app as well. Um, really, really nice design and, and stuff. Uh, but they also have this very interesting and uh, unique property um, that when I make a workspace in Craft, like a place to put some notes, um, they have two options. Um, and so here, here are what those options are. The first option is to use their cloud sync service. So your notes are stored on their servers. Um, just like, uh, let's say, Notion or Google Docs. And you get a lot that comes along with that. So you can have multiple people in the doc at the same time collaborating. You can comment on the docs. You can uh, create a URL to share a doc with someone on the web. Uh, they have version control built in, so you get backups. Um, all the stuff that you've come to expect from kind of modern collaborative apps, right? But they also have this other second option, which is to store your notes on your local file system. That's what this like external location thing means. And that gives you all these other benefits. So um, you get a lot more interoperability because you can use different apps to open these files that they've saved for you. Um, it's much more private because you don't need to upload everything you write to their servers. Um, you have a lot more uh, sort of control over where the data goes. Uh, there's much stronger guarantees that the data will continue to be around forever, even if Kraft goes out of business. So there's all these neat things you get from storing the data in your files, uh, file system. And it's really nice that Craft gives you this choice. I think it's, it's uh, probably the best they could realistically do in the, mod, in the way things are set up today. But it really bugs me every time I go to write a note thinking about, hmm, which would I prefer today? Would I like you know, convenient real-time sync and comments or would I like you know, the ability to open my, my documents in multiple apps and, and this other stuff? So. Um, what I want to try to convince you of today is that we should not take this trade-off as given and that could we come up with something where we don't have to choose one or the other. That's, that's sort of the, the problem I want to talk about today. So 
let's zoom out a bit and just think a little bit about what exactly are these benefits we're getting from each of these, uh, these uh, methods of storing data. So I made a little table. Um, this table is partially inspired by um, a wonderful essay by the Ink and Switch Research Lab, including Adam Wiggins, who I see is here on the call. Um, and so this is partially derived from that essay. You should go read it if you want a deeper dive into some of this, um, but this is kind of my own spin on it. So what we have here is two rows for those options I just mentioned, traditional file system and collaborative cloud apps. And then we have some properties we care about. So let's go through these columns one by one. So I'm gonna start with interop, which I think for me is the most uh, important problem I care about. I also call this bring your own client. Um, so what do I mean by bring your own client? I think bring your own client is the ability to separately choose what app you wanna to use to manipulate some data. So the data doesn't dictate the app you use. So for example, I think a lot of people in this community are probably familiar with this app called uh, Obsidian. I use it to take notes in Markdown. And the key selling point, right, is that um, it stores Markdown files that represent your notes, which means that you can also edit those Markdown files in other apps. So I frequently will open an Obsidian note in this other app called IA Writer because it just looks really different. And sometimes I prefer that writing interface. Also before Obsidian had mobile app, they recommended just use some Markdown editor on your phone. It's fine. Um, you can use whatever tool you like. And, you know, I think it's worth reflecting on, hold on, like, why does this really matter, right? Do we really care about bring your own client? Is it actually a big deal? And I, but I wanna argue that it is, we really should care. So why? Well, I think there are a few good reasons. One is that um, I, I believe tools matter. And specifically, I think if you're trying to do really great work in some sort of craft, um, you're trying to do to produce the best possible thoughts and ideas you, you, your, your mind is capable of, you're really striving for excellence, you're in this tool maybe like five, six hours a day. Um, that's the type of thing where tools can really matter. And even if it's some sort of amorphous personal preference, like I have a lot of trouble writing in certain UIs and I can't explain to you why I don't like writing in it. I just, I just don't like it. And I, it, it you know, meaningfully harms my ability to think and work sometimes. And so um, I think a good analogy here is chef's knives, which I've illustrated uh, on the slide. You know, people have different preferences for knives and it's sort of hard to explain why it's sometimes a knife just feels good. Um, but tools matter, I think, for doing great work. Um, a second thing is, if you have interop, you can build a lot of deep expertise in one general tool and use it in tons of different places. I think this is an underrated advantage, advantage of interop. So for example, you'll meet a lot of programmers who love one specific code editor and have brought it with them from job to job for like 30 years, right? Um, I'm a Vim person or whatever. And the reason they can do that is because every job they go to, they can just bring their own text editor that they know and love and use it there. Um, if we don't have interop, you sort of are stuck building little bits of expertise in lots of different tools and you can never really commit and invest in one because you're not gonna be able to use it enough to justify that investment. Um, a third reason I think is different tools for different jobs. This is a core part of the Unix philosophy, just the idea that you don't wanna use, you know, um, or that different, at different stages of work, you might, you, you might want different kinds of tools to work with some data. So for example, you know, a markdown file, I might have uh, one mode where I'm writing the first draft and I prefer some really clean like markdown -y interface. And then it's going into my uh, static website generator for my blog. And I want sort of more code oriented view because I'm like adding HTML tags and stuff. So I might do that in VS Code, right? There's different stages of the workflow. Um, and finally, a last fourth point is that I think it's really important that people be able to work together while using different tools. Because all of this, right, um, this, this idea of personal preference, it matters uh, even more if you're on a team. Because if you have to be on a team and everyone has to agree on the, the single tool you're all going to use, that's a tremendous source of friction. And I think in my experience, typically what happens is basically um, in the cloud context, right? You just have to agree on some lowest common denominator and hope that it's okay for everyone. Let's say, you know, we're all going to use Google Docs. That's like one example. Um, but if people have meaningful different preferences about tools, that isn't always like a, a, a sort of acceptable outcome. So I think these are four reasons why 
bring your own client really matters. Um, and of course, you know, we kind of lost this. So in the file system, we had a lot of that interrupt with the markdown files. But meanwhile, in the cloud, these are some data silos on a farm somewhere. Um, looks like middle America, maybe. And you have the Google Docs silo, you have the Apple Notes silo, you have the Notion silo, blah, blah, blah. Um, and what, you know, specifically what I mean by data silos is you can export import between these things, kind of, but that's a very weak form of getting data between services. I can't send you a Google Doc and you open an Apple Notes and we just collaborate on it live, right? That's a very like alien concept, even though in the file system world, it's totally natural to do that sort of thing. And so we've sort of gotten used to this world where persistence and UI are just totally coupled together. Okay, so that fills in our first column of the table. Interop, uh, file system's good. Collaborative cloud apps, not so much. Um, the second column I think is uh, its own whole topic. I won't go deep into it, but there's a lot of stuff around just data ownership and control. So, you know, uh, as I mentioned, it, with a file system, it's easier to keep your data forever or delete it when you want. You can keep things private. Um, I think a really fun and um, underrated benefit is just being able to put different kinds of data in one place. So you have a project and you have pictures and you have text and you have PDFs and you can just put all those things in a folder, right? Whereas in cloud apps, you know, if I have Figma mockups and Notion product specs, you know, there's sort of a, it's, there, it's not actually easy to compile all these cloud resources across apps and collect them together. Every app has its own mechanisms of organization, which is um, sort of bizarre when you start thinking about that too. Um, and so I would argue file systems offer better data ownership and control. Um, so, so far the file system is winning, but of course we all know we're all using, at least I'm using mostly cloud apps all day. And why? It's because of this third column, real-time collaboration, right? So traditional file systems just were not up for the task of the modern multiplayer workflows we want. We all have terrible nightmares about final revised v2.docx. Right, um, and then e we can try to do like emailing files back and forth. We can try to do syncing files with like iCloud Drive, and you end up with these terrible um, conflict messages where you have to like manually figure out which of these versions of this doc is the right one, and so on. And so the file system really falls down in that category, while Google Docs and the cloud apps—that's where they shine. And it turned out that that was such a big benefit that we all went to the cloud, despite these other columns in the table. Um, so that's sort of, I think, a, a, a one view of the, the world that we've ended up with. And again, I encourage you to read the local first software piece if you haven't for sort of a much deeper dive on all this. But the question I wanna pose is why not both? Like why do we really have to just accept this dichotomy? So can we make the third row? Like what is this missing file, like next gen file system thing that checks all these boxes? What would it feel like? What would it look like? Um, and that's sort of the, the thing that I think we should all be striving for and we should be trying to figure out what that is. Let's see, I, I don't see the chats, but I see the number 39 on my chat bubble. I guess this is a good pausing point. Are there any burning questions I should address before moving on? My summary would be most people are agreeing with you and, and also already proposing potential, like, uh, well, just relating related areas. Yeah, mostly just big okay. ups, as cool. Gordon puts it. <laughs> okay, I'll keep going. Yeah, I have, I have a feeling this is a crowd that sort of, um, probably some people here have already come to this conclusion. And so I'll just, I'll, uh, I guess it's, it's a sympathetic crowd, yeah. Um, so, okay, assume this is a good idea. I wanna talk a bit about um, some speculation of how, how it might feel, you know? Um, and then second, some of the biggest problems I see in getting there. So, yeah, so what would, it, what would it be like to use this missing file system? Well, I'm imagining, you know, here I have uh, AwesomeFS, uh, which may look a little bit like an existing file system that you may have used before. Um, but there's a key difference from, from Google Drive, which is that when I right click on one of these files, I get open in or open with, right? That's such a foreign concept in the cloud world. And what if, what if I can just click Apple Notes and open that Google Doc directly in Apple Notes? So then I'm opening it in one app, someone else is editing in another, and we're just real-time syncing, right? That's the key idea. I know it's, this is an incredibly simple uh, mock-up, but I think it's like a, a, a strangely, like whenever I think about how this uh, would feel, it just feels so 
foreign to me, you know, in the in the current context of cloud apps. And I think um, I mean, technically, just, Google just, Drive has that open in. It's just terrible. OK, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's not we can get into, yeah, the, the drawbacks of. This is like a deeper idea of open in, I think. Um, and then, you know, beyond this, I think you can start imagining other uh, examples where the tools start to diverge a little bit more than that. So for example, a lot of teams I know do project management uh, in Notion where they have like product plans and stuff, but then the engineers are in GitHub issues doing the day-to-day the -day tasks. And then, you know, I talk to people who uh, do manual copying between these things um, because there's just these data silos, right? But what if we could just find those together and have it feel like our, our missing file system just has our project in it? So I can use GitHub issues when I want that interface and I can use a notion table embedded in my project plan when I want that interface. Um, there's another sort of uh, more speculative demo that I've been uh, playing with, which is, uh, so here the, the idea is that we're doing a road mapping exercise and we have our backlog in Trello, right? Our sort of card based UI. But we also wanna do this more spatial thinking exercise where we have this uh, drawing up top where we have this, these two axes of what's valuable to our existing customers and what's valuable to our new, uh, new sales. And we want as a team to just move these cards around like we're you know, doing index cards on a whiteboard and think in that way. But there's this disconnect where ugh, the roadmap's in Trello and we have to like somehow get it in there and then get the data back into Trello. So what if uh, all of this was stored in the missing file system and Trello and in this case Figma, which is the drawing tool here, were just light user interfaces over that shared data store. So everything we do in one just real-time syncs to the other. Um, so I have a little demo here where I'm selecting um, cards in the Figma uh, canvas up there. And, and, and there's this little embedded table view in Figma that I can use to edit data. So I'm selecting some tasks, I'm editing data within Figma. And you can see in the bottom, uh, as I edit stuff in Figma, the Trello board also updates to reflect the latest state of that data. Um, and so, and the key thing there is, you know, I can do visual selections in Figma to subset that table and then edit the table when it goes into Trello. And so, you know, that's just like a, I made that demo in like a few hours. It's not that, uh, it could be a lot better, but the, the point is to start thinking of these cloud apps that we use every day as just UIs over the missing file system rather than their own uh, separate uh, data stores. Okay, so um, Jeff, there was a Rob had a question for you. He mm -hmm. was saying that the Notion GitHub issues example raises the question: Can these sort of can these sort of uh, interfaces be crowdsourced templates for API integrations? And Rob, feel free to unmute yourself and expand on that if you like. Yeah, I mean, really, just the question is like: To what degree do you need a you know common data substrate? you know, as compared to just being like, hey, um, this is our uh, GitHub issues to Notion bridge, you know, and anyone can just bring that when uh, anywhere they want. Yeah, that is a great question. Um, so, okay, so I think there's a couple, couple things there. Um, one is that to some extent you can already do this kind of thing, right? So you can try to use Zapier to like wire together some cloud services. That's like not a new thing. Um, however, I think that um, there's a couple of problems with that. One is that actually establishing good two-way synchronizations between different cloud services is really hard. Like it's very difficult to do that well in, in a tool like Zapier um, and just rolling your own as a programmer is really hard. And so I think um, I, I, I mean for these demos to be more like a sort of sketch of if we lived in this world with a common data substrate, because we already have these cloud apps that we use today, like how would it feel if they were all just linked together? Um, and I think there's a lot of, you could imagine a lot of different mechanisms for that sort of integration um, under the hood, but I don't think the current I don't think that like API integrations as they exist today are quite uh, rich enough to really do a good job of this kind of synchronization, um, if that makes sense. Like concretely, I making these demos was really hard for me. You know, um, I had to do a lot of work to make them. It wasn't easy. And there's also this sort of N squared problem where you have to integrate everything with everything. Whereas in the file system, it's just all in the file system by default. 
right? So I think there are some um, some tricky issues there. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, that's totally a helpful perspective. Thank you. Uh, just reminds me of. Um, uh, sorry to interject, but just it just reminds me of uh, Oliver Sauter talking about interoperability last time around or the time before, uh, or or like in some other event where basically he was just talking about like bespoke integrations, you know, uh, where you're like, oh, our users like to uh, integrate these two things or have these directly related. So we'll just make that integration, make it easy. But that N squared thing is... Um, definitely a useful limitation to that to keep in mind. Yeah, and one more thing I will say too is that I think you can sort of approach this general problem from two directions. So one direction is to say, okay, we gotta go build the shared data substrate and then we'll build a whole new app ecosystem on that substrate, right? The other way is to say, well, we kind of have the data silos, they're here, we all use them. So how can we sort of pull those data silos towards the shared data substrate? And I made these demos intentionally with the more the latter way of thinking in mind. Uh, but I think both are valuable and there has to be some sort of meeting in the middle there. Um, so I guess I'll, I don't have that much more to say, but I'll close with, um, again, these are just sketches. Um, I don't have like the thing, you know, I haven't made this thing to show you, but I wanna close with talking about a couple of, I think the trickiest, gnarliest challenges. And I would love to hear thoughts from you all on how you think about these challenges. Um, so yeah, so if one big question is how you agree on data formats. This one's really, um, I think, at the heart of the whole issue. Um, it's really hard to agree on global standards across all applications, in particular because um, part of the great thing about having a bunch of applications is that they often make different design decisions. You know, Notion couldn't have been built on top of the, the Markdown format. It just isn't really the same thing, um, you know, and so um, like the, the, the core question here is how can we get interoperability without insisting that everyone necessarily fully standardizes? Um, you know, those of you who are Obsidian users have probably seen Markdown is kind of at the center of this weird um, activity, I think these days where it's being stretched in strange ways that it wasn't intended to be stretched and um, people are really pushing the limits of that format. So that's sort of a, a very tricky challenge. Um, one project I've worked on called Cambria uh, tried to suggest some ideas for addressing this by not aiming for 100% perfect compatibility, but for uh, making it easy to specify mappings between data formats that get as much meaning back and forth as possible in the synchronization while allowing for some, you know, for apps to store different data around the edges. Um, I think that's a promising direction to consider further. However, I will note that uh, our example app in Cambria, which you can see at the bottom here, was a to-do list. And to-do lists are pretty structured uh, data. You know, they sort of, uh, you could imagine having a to-do list in a spreadsheet, right? It's sort of tabular feeling. And the more I dig into note-taking and rich text, I've come to believe that I think uh, interoperability of formatted text across tools is like really messy. Um, there are just tricky incompatibilities between uh, the richness of formatting that different editors offer, whether you have a block model or sort of a whole text document model and mapping across those is very non-obvious. So um, I think that's a, that's a question to ponder. And then my last, you know, the second and last question that everyone I think always brings up when this topic comes up is, oh no, you know, the capitalist companies don't want this to happen. So it will never happen. What are we gonna do? Um, and I think that's to some extent, that's, that's a fair observation to make that cloud apps benefit in many ways from the data silo. However, I think there are a couple uh, hopeful takes on that question. One is that I wouldn't assume that every app developer wants a data mode. It just is the default way to build. If I was building a web app today, I'm gonna probably just have a database and store the data, right? I'm not like, there's, there's not great alternative options yet, I think. And so we shouldn't just assume that everyone um, really wants this architecture. I think it has been sort of an accident for in some cases. Um, another thing I think is cool is that business customers who use SaaS products really want interoperability. They want all their tools to work together, right? And I think um, it's possible that maybe that can push B2B software towards being more interoperable. 
A third question I want to ask is, can we get started towards this without requiring everyone to rewrite all the apps or making the app devs do any work? So that's part of why I showed you this demo. It's like I've I've made demos where I just like hook up the, the you know GitHub issues API to some uh, like sync layer that I made and try to make it work. And there are limits to that, how far you can go with sort of working from the outside there. But I think maybe that's a starting point. Um, and then a final closing question is how do you keep all this open? Um, ideally, we would like to avoid having one company maybe that like runs the missing file system. Uh, and so that's, but then how do you fund that? There's all sorts of interesting questions there too. So these are some of the challenges I think to ponder. Um, okay, I guess before I close, I'll just uh, finish by saying there's really cool projects going on in this space. Here are a few pointers if you're interested. Um, the Solid Project, Tim Berners-Lee is trying to basically do a lot of what I just described. Um, of course, there's Fission, which uh, Boris and team are working on, um, and they have a lot of uh, fun ideas in this space. Um, there's a project called Braid, which is trying to extend HTTP to be a stateful synchronization protocol. Very interesting work um, that sort of is exactly targeting a similar vision. Um, and finally, there's a, a neat website called Zero Data Apps, which has, um, it's sort of a compilation of a bunch of apps that work in this way. They call it Zero Data and pointers to other, other tools in space. So um, I hope I've convinced you that uh, we really need this thing. And I would love to hear your thoughts on how we, how we get there. Thanks so much. Great job. Thank you, that's Jeff. The, that's the traditional jazz hands of how you uh, <laughs> applause on video. Gotcha. Um, let me see. I saw one question. Oh, uh, Gordon actually asked for a real quick overview of how Fission works. Um, Boris, do you want to do that? And then Gary, I see your hands up as well. So we'll go to you next. Okay. Uh, very briefly, um, essentially, we're building on top of IPFS, the interplanetary file system. Um, which is roughly in a web three space, but uh, doesn't use any blockchains or anything else like that. Think of it as a like slightly fancier BitTorrent uh, and Git mashed together, where instead of having a file path and a location, every single file in the system has a content address or hash. So it is 100% portable because it doesn't care where stuff is, just what it is. Um, so I'm very bullish on, uh, on IPFS and content addressing as a tool. On top of it, we've built some identity and encryption primitives, um, as well as application primitives. Um, and all the stuff that we're building is, is, uh, is open source. Awesome. Thanks, Boris. Uh, Gary, you want to ask your question? Yes, uh, but just one, one comment on, on Boris, what Boris just said. I mean. Just the other day, I woke up and realized, well, with the IPFS and Fission, the, in the old days, the, when the network became fast enough, the network became the computer. With IPFS, the network is the global, giant, common-based data store. So there's no more silos, no need. You can actually make it private. There is nebulous, which enables you to treat the data exactly with the same content IDs without actually sharing it on the network. So there's no more database needed. Okay, for perhaps for, for uh, under 10 seconds latency you may, but not for human communication. Okay, so that, that's just preaching over. Uh, I really like the, the last point you, you made about rich text and nodes, because uh, indeed this is, this is uh, what I've been working on for a long, long time exactly that if you've got a rich, rich text, just listicles and no, no fancy. Oh, yeah. Hello. <laughs> I, I think uh, an accidental unmute there, Gary. So keep, keep going. Yeah. So, so basically that means uh, exactly this would actually work with work you even with, with uh, Markdown. I came up with this mark in notation which basically enables you to inject the semantics, the, the, the intention as part of your text. So you got the text and these, these notations can actually, actually on the fly articulate what you mean, what, what the purpose, and actually you can use those terms as a kind of DSL, you know, domain specific language. And I really would like to show that next month because by that time it will be ready, so. 
watch this space. Thank you very much. Yeah, that'd be awesome, Gary. Jeff, anything to respond to? There? Yeah, I mean, on that last point, I think um, one very important thing in the rich tech space is that I think the challenges, so we already are seeing the challenges of designing a file format on a traditional file system that works well with multiple uh, thinking tools, right? Like Markdown is being stretched, as I said, but adding uh, real-time collaboration sort of adds a whole new ingredient to the problem um, in particular. So I've spent this actually this past summer working on um, formats for modeling collaborative uh, formatted rich text. And, you know, just as, as an example, like, um, there are lots of approaches to modeling plain text in a way that when people edit it simultaneously, it will all end up looking right. But you can't just take that uh, plain text collaboration approach, throw a markdown document in there and expect it to work, right? So like as a very simple example, if I make something on H1 by adding a little uh, hashtag in front of it, and then you do the same, there will be two hashtags. There will be an H2, which isn't what either of us meant, you know? And so um, we, we can't just uh, take uh, sort of the thinking of traditional uh, text formats into the collaborative world. I think we actually need to design whole new formats uh, that take into account uh, convergence of collaborative editing plus formatting. Um, and when and that's just, it gets tricky, but I'm working on it. Can I just um, respond yeah. quickly to that? That uh, the point is that if if your marking is, is, is on its own new line, so it's, it's sort of extending, then you don't need anything fancy new. Because it, it, you, can, you can devise this notation in a way that, that, that avoids these problems. Any yeah, other, just to, uh, yeah. It, it, yeah, I mean, this is a rabbit hole. I just, I referenced at JSON and a, and a link in there. Um, literally the problem of you collaborating with your past self, if you want to retain data, Markdown doesn't cut it. Oh, I'll just put it in Git. Cool, you're a developer that works for you. It is not generally portable, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. AKA the schema issue and so on. So um, a lot of people are really resistant to this because we've got 30 years of Vim and Emacs and plain text files and it works for developers. If we care about other people using this, we're the ones who are gonna have to work on rich text editors and compatibility and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's hard. Yeah, and Boris, you mentioned in the chat at JSON. So at JSON is a really neat uh, format, I think. Did Blaine come on this session maybe and talk about it a few months ago? So um, the rough idea is you have a plain text string with a bunch of uh, format spans overlaid over the string that indicate things like this text is bold or this is a paragraph. And it's a really neat idea. Um, and the work that I've been doing when it can switch on rich text back uh, on collaborative rich text formats is inspired by at JSON. Um, at JSON alone doesn't quite cut it because it's not actually designed as a sort of collaborative format that multiple people are editing at the same time. So you have to, uh, take those ideas into a sort of, and think about CRDTs and how changes merge and, and stuff on top of that. Um, we'll, we'll be publishing more about that ongoing work uh, within the next couple of months probably, but um, yeah. Awesome, look forward to that. Um, Kevin, you had a question? Uh, yeah, uh, first off, we great talk. Um, and I think you highlight some of the main issues uh, something that's also been on top of my mind. I think this idea of like those two problems, one is the shared file system and one is the shared file format. And while Markdown is, I would I would say that nobody would say Markdown is the latest format. It is also kind of the format that kind of like uh, mosquitoes, it's here. And generally in the industry, we have the whole horse is better, like JSON beat XML, JavaScript versus like any same programming language. Like at the end of the day, it seems like what really wins out is adoption. And once you have a wide adoption, you can kind of force a format. If you have enough people working on it, it eventually gets good enough. And so do you think moving forward, like would like, I guess it's more of like a broader question of like, do you see Markdown being eventually good enough that people build enough tooling on top of it where it can become a common data format? Or do you think that it really takes, you know, something more uh, white room? Great question. 
I don't know the answer, but I can give the optimistic like uh, if so I think if that were to happen, I think it would be a reflection of a neat pattern that I've seen where sort of um, so as an example, like uh, let's take JSON that you mentioned. So JSON is interesting because um, you can always just open it up in a text editor and see with the data and manually edit it if you want to. Um, and you can have a much, you can build much better UIs on top of any specific JSON blob, but you always have the option to fall back into the text editor and just edit it, right? And no one's gonna argue that manually editing JSON in a text editor is an amazing experience, but at least it's better than some binary format that you can't even open in the text editor. I think maybe you could make a similar argument for Markdown, which is to say, um, the more people try to stuff into it to power tools like Obsidian, the bigger the gap will become where like the Obsidian experience just keeps getting more and more better than like the plain, you know, editing it in Notepad or whatever. But at least you can fall back and you can think of it as kind of like a, almost like you're editing this raw format that isn't like ideal, but it's sort of, uh, you know, better than nothing. And then you have specialized tools that interpret parts of the format in better ways. So maybe that's, maybe that's an acceptable place to be. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it's not something I expect an answer from. I just think it's interesting because it's like programming languages. I would say like JavaScript is a perfect example. Well, like Haskell is like in theory great, but in practice, not much adopted where JavaScript sucks in all accounts, but it's widely adopted. And now you have tooling like TypeScript that is filling in most of the gaps. And so just, you know, curious about the future to see if like the same thing will happen with Markdown versus some other format. Yeah, I mean, I will say more broadly on the worse is better point, like for all, for this entire problem that I'm talking about, I think one of the most important questions is how the heck are we gonna get any of this adopted? And in particular, what are the things that people actually care enough about to make this happen? So personally, I don't believe that um, personal control over data or privacy or even interoperability in a lot of cases is, is gonna be enough to move the needle for a lot of people. And so I spend a lot of time trying to think about, you know, who are the people who will pay a lot of money for this thing to exist, you know? Um, one hypothesis I might have is that um, it's businesses actually, and it's not, it's, not tool, it's not really like individuals trying to take notes. It's more like I have employees who spend five hours a day copying data from Excel to this stupid app. And I just wish it was all stored in one place um, mm -hmm. as sort of a motivating problem. Um, that's, a, that's a hypothesis. I don't know if that uh, will work, but I think more broadly just, you know, being really pragmatic about adoption is a good idea. I think the fact that we're talking about an on-disk storage format is in fact the thing that we might wanna think about that we feel very strongly about. Uh, Rob gave an example uh, at one point where he's like, I use eight different tools to edit my markdown. I'm like, cool. Um, whereas if we're designing, designing a software system, um, we design a data format that is optimized for what we needed to do. If you're optimizing it for CRDTs or annotations or multi-user or whatever. So just like Jeffrey said, that app JSON wasn't really designed for this over the wire syncing thing. Correct. It was designed to solve a problem at a publishing house to have forward and backward perfect fidelity um, between different formats. And it does a really good job of that. And it turns out that we could, that, like there literally already is a markdown adapter. So if you want to keep markdown stuff on files, and transit through at JSON, which itself is JSON that sits on disks as well, you could do that. Or we could stuff it all in a graph database and we don't have to have this discussion. On that note, I don't see any more hands up and we do have one more speaker and I wanna give Jared the chance to, I think he will equally challenge our brains uh, today. Um, if you guys have further questions for, um, uh, for for Jeffrey, feel free to duke it out in the chat for now. And I'm gonna give Jared a second here to talk. Um, so Jared, uh, Jared is a software engineer, an educator, and generally a very deep thinker. Um, he got his start working on education initi initiatives at Consensus, interestingly, trying to build incentivized educational projects on the Ethereum blockchain. And this was, uh, I don't know, five or more years ago, Jared, is that right? Something like that, I see you nodding. Okay, cool. Um, so this was back when no one knew who Consensus was or really what Ethereum was. Um, so Jared was around early days then. Currently, he's one of the founders of the Hyperlink Academy. You can find Hyperlink Academy at hyperlink.academy or link from his website, um, which is visible on the screen, um, which is an experimental school 
And uh, Jared, when I mean that Jared is a deep thinker, I mean that when he was thinking about how to build a school, he realized that one of the problems, one of the main problems with the uh, school is that you need an environment to uh, work in that enforces kind of his the ideals that they have around the way that education works. And when he realized that there are no environments like that, he set out to build one himself. And so he's building this experimental environment called hyperspace, which is this weird hybrid of like a collaboration tool with like a real time collaborative text editor and like a wiki and all of those ideas like munched together. So it's a it's a beautiful experiment. And I'm excited to have Jared share with us about why educational environments need tools for thought. So thank you, Jess. Uh Are we seeing that? Yep. Cool. Yeah. So like just said, the basic framing here, I'm, this talk's going to be a little bit more high level uh, than Jeffrey's. It's uh, around like, given that we're making all these tools for thoughts, what are we going to do with them? What are the features that they have? How do they work? Uh, things like that. And so like you said, I work on Hyperlink Academy. It's a school specifically, uh, meaning that people come there to learn and to do things and to grow. And broadly speaking, I care about making things that make people better or expand the things that they are capable of doing. Um, and I think that that definition fits very broadly into thinking about the kinds of things that we in the Tools for Thought community are building and also into educational experiences. And I think there's actually a lot of uh, very fundamental connections between those two endeavors and making tools that make people better and making social systems that make people better, perhaps and kind of want to explore the intersections of those and then talk a little bit about what we're building and some threads that we're thinking about that uh, take advantage of that intersection. So one sort of distinction between the two is that technology for education broadly for features very high level constructs. So it'll often, I don't know if any of you have had the misfortune of using a lot of LMSs, but it, uh, generally has very big shapes that people are there, the classes, their sessions, there are assignments, there are these very um, high level things that people are working with. And you can kind of think about this even outside of like tech technology and look at a university or school, they're just very big systems that people are working with. And generally speaking, I'd say the tools for thought that people in this community are thinking about generally have very low level primitives. They have backlinks, notes, hierarchies, all these very um, small pieces that are then assembled into larger things by the users. Uh, and interestingly, I think that the biases of these two sides of things actually lead to uh, some of their shortcomings as well. And so broadly, uh, another kind of distinction here is that education, people change and grow by doing things with people. And in the tools for thought space, people change and grow via interacting with information. So like organizing things, uh, querying, searching, it's all about um, less about activity and more about data. And in the educational space, it's very much, they're very poor data systems, but it's all much more about activity and doing things together. And so one of the shortcomings that I've sort of noticed in this is that, um, most of these very abstract tools for thought, like Rome, Notion, City, and all of those, um, give the user a bunch of primitives, but don't really anchor those in a very specific context that they are going to grow more capable in, whether that's the context of the tool itself or the domain that the person is using the tool in, if that makes sense. And on the flip side, education does provide that context for getting better in this specific domain, but it doesn't have the expressivity to actually capture the domains that people care about. So uh, going back to there, if we think about someone using their uh, knowledge base to chart their development in, or to learn about guitars, broadly speaking, to play the guitar, um, it's gonna be a really great resource for compiling all the information that they're coming across about guitar, but it's not going to uh, support them in getting better as a guitar player, broadly speaking. And that to me is a shortcoming because if we're thinking about these tools as expanding people's capacity, the thing that's probably gonna 
expand that person's capacity to do things with guitar most is to learn about it broadly. Now, compiling all the information is not going to be useful unless they manifest that knowledge within themselves. And on the flip side, uh, education technology might provide a really great environment for coming across people uh, who are learning about guitars, but it's not going to give you the tools to actually capture the domain of knowledge that is uh, mapping out chords, mapping out your practice scheme, mapping out the songs you want to do, all the kind of educational technologies that are sort of standard today will have these very high level abstract notions of classes and things like that, but not the very low level notions of the domains that people are actually learning within. Um, and education broadly, the focus on high level structures makes specificity hard and learning comes from the specific interactions between people and new contexts, right? And the most transformative learning experiences take advantage of those specific things. So the specific backgrounds that people have, the specific experiences and the specific aspects of the domains of knowledge that they care about. Um, and so with hyperspace, broadly, we're trying to experiment in this intersection and make a tool for thought that is also a educational environment, also a school or a university or something like that. Um, and so right now, hyperspace looks pretty vanilla, broadly. It's this like, Markdown-esque uh, document editor. We've got links, we've got backlinks. Um, interestingly, there's this little join call thing on um, every page throughout the space. And we use that to do some interesting things. Um, and so I'll be sort of referring back here uh, to kind of talk about how some of the hypothetical things and thinking would be anchored in this uh, real thing right now. Um, so there are kind of like three main threads I want to explore, which is one, how can we create named explicit high-level primitives from low-level primitives? So if we think things like learning structures, courses, um, curriculums, things like that are important, how can we achieve that with the tools that we have? Um, two, how can we use spatial metaphors to encode the relationships between stuff in our space? Um, and three, what, what mechanisms can we create in order to create constraints? And I'll talk a little bit why I think all of those are very important for the sort of learning of, uh, endeavor of learning broadly. Um, so on the first one, this might be an obvious point, but I think what's important is that we need as sort of human beings doing informational tasks, we need both high level and low level structures. So we need things like uh, very highly motivated goal oriented contexts, like being in a course or a class or a curriculum. And we also need to be able to just uh, write things uh, and manipulate sort of smaller data structures. Um, and in my opinion, the high level structures should be explicit in that they exist, they have names, they're things that we can talk about, but they're not privileged things within the system that we're building. So you could imagine um, if we're talking about building this infrastructure, we might want to make courses like a first class citizen, right? So anyone can make a course within hyperspace and that would have granted certain features and certain capabilities within the system. But I think that that actually limits um, it creates pretty strong limitations on what those high level constructs can do. And it's rather, it, it sort of leads back to the same problem with existing LMSs where the big things you want can't match the specific features. And so what we want is kind of best of both worlds. We want the high level structures, but those to be composed in an unprivileged way from low level structures. And so one way we're trying to do that in hyperspace right now is creating a course environment just by composing documents. And this isn't like a new thing. It's, I think we've seen lots of people do this with um, Notion and things like that, building online courses. This is just sort of our take on it. Um, and so this is sort of the MetaCourse homepage. It lists out uh, the activities and the resources available in the MetaCourse. Uh, it has links from the things people who are taking the MetaCourse are doing, as well as the other pages that uh, the sort of more high level um, Department of Pedagogy. That's my co-founder Brendan's uh, coining. And yeah, and so if we hop into the specific cohort, 
this maps out the sort of activities in the space, things like that. And we can kind of have this structural space just composed out of smaller things here. Um, if we go back here, uh, it's important for this to work that the primitives that you're using are useful in multiple different contexts for learners and teachers and facilitators. So if we built this whole thing out as like a rich document editor, but only teachers could create documents uh, to create a course page, that would kind of entirely defeat the purpose where basically you now just have uh, something that is, again, privileged as a high level construct. And instead, what we're trying to do is uh, that the same thing here is used for the course creator to make the course homepage as is for the, um, let me see if I can find one here, the uh, course takers to create their little workshop spaces, their uh, course ideas, et cetera. Um, yeah, and so one thing you may have noticed in me hopping through here is that uh, given, given the current shape of things, things very much lack a sense of place or context. We have all these linear documents and relationships between one another. And I think sort of in the tools for thought space, we're really, we really like relationships between stuff. We really like data to have links and uh, semantic connections to other things. And that is, uh, I think, a very strong point in the tools we're building right now. Um, but those, those kinds of rich relationships are really important for when people want to do activities together and they're going to want to learn in this space. Going back to the guitar example, a learning environment that has a first class notion of like uh, the relationships between uh, certain chords and the scales that they belong to or things like that is a much more expressive environment for talking to someone about uh, those relationships and that domain than a kind of uh, big long text that just lists things out, for example. Um, and so it's especially important that we have these relationships when we're working with other people because we tend to use them to achieve these specific goals and to communicate and to be situated within a specific context. And finally, the human beings are very good at sort of uh, seeing at how things relate to each other in space. And that sort of goes on all levels from like a very high map level geographies to the locations of things within a room to the shapes of objects and how they relate to one another. So we have all this built in machinery for um, thinking about relations that we often take it for granted in a physical environment when learning with other people. And so what we're trying to think about is how can we achieve a similar thing where it is very clear what the relationships between things are and how they cor correspond to one another um, without just copying wholesale, trying to make a uh, physical world in the digital space. And so Facebook recently did their sort of AR thing and AR and the metaverse is kind of a very big thing right now. But I'm really interested in how can we sort of copy that trait of physical spatial reality of making relationships very explicit without giving up all the interesting relationships that we can encode in the digital reality. Um, and so we have sort of a couple loose ideas to this, but this is actually probably one of the areas that we fall shortest on in hyperspace currently. So uh, one idea is sort of tracking the provenance of objects. So talking about where, if we're looking here about a, like this little block, we can uh, talk about where it came from, when it was created, um, where Aslan, who made it, was uh, active when he created it, and all these things that could anchor it a little bit more in relation to other things. Or uh, in another thread, we can sort of combine, like I mentioned earlier, we have this little join Paul primitive, um, and if it exists on sort of every single page within the system. And so can we use that to kind of um, anchor uh, the things that people do. So when you do join a call, uh, I don't know how this will do with Zoom. It sort of, it gives you a little header that stays with you as you navigate around. And can we use this as a way to create context and space and anchor experience through these uh, network data structures? 
as opposed to uh, sort of letting people wander around freely. Um, and finally, can we have this sort of like connect back to the provenance thing, but can we, we can kind of, I've kind of glossed over a lot of implementation details here, which I know this crowd might have been much more interested in than this, but everything in here is this kind of like uh, triple store style data architecture, entity attribute value. And so everything you're seeing from the page to blocks um, to uh, your homepage has a entity identifier. And so it's possible that we could have like a little right click and inspect entity attribute or a some kind of gesture to pull out the attributes of that entity and talk about how they relate to each other. Um, so that's kind of one thing we're thinking about. And then given that we have this big system with all sorts of things relating to each other, um, it turns out that uh, sometimes you don't want absolute freedom to mess around with anything in the system. Sometimes you need constraints and you need those constraints for all sorts of purposes. Um, but specifically, we want to limit the things that we can do to achieve specific outcomes, whether that's someone else imposing those limitations to achieve a specific social outcome or a yourself achieving uh, constraining, putting in those limitations in order to achieve some productive goal or creative purpose. Um, and we have these kinds of things in video games and rituals and productivity systems where constraining our behavior is a very important thing that we do on our own and together with other people. Um, and we need systems for constraining behavior to coordinate or restrict human activity throughout this whole thing, which is kind of the overarching purpose of, uh, or kind of a fundamental thing you need in order to create learning and educational environments. Um, and so our kind of, this is, we've kind of like progressed from most concrete to loosest, but the general idea we're thinking about here is a prompt or program block that has a little bit of um, JavaScript that defines um, read and write behaviors to other entities within the system and renders a really minimal text-based interface. And so you can kind of think of it as like a little uh, text game that is embedded in various spaces in hyperspace. Um, and so one where we want to get to is where some primitive like this is actually the main thing that people are creating. So if you think about social networks, probably uh, there's this sort of like 90-10 dichotomy where 90% of people are consuming things that other people are creating or initiating and 10% are the productive or the people making things. And I don't want to put I don't think there is really a sort of a moral weight on that, but that's just kind of how these things distribute. And so one question is, can you make the thing that the 10% are making be uh, mechanisms for activity as opposed to um, mechanisms for consumption or content, something like that? Um, so yeah, this is kind of, I know these were kind of very high level and broad, but uh, the basic idea here is that uh, for a tool to meaningfully make people better, that is fundamentally sort of an educational, not make people better in the general sense, but make them more capable of doing something more powerful. Uh, that is essentially, in my view, an educational endeavor. And it you can get a lot by taking from both the ideas and technologies in the uh, tools for thought space, but also we need the sort of, especially kind of moral, the, the kind of uh, educational approach from educational philosophy and things like that broadly. Um, and so there's some kind of high level open questions here, one of which is that I, people during this talk might have been having this uh, reaction to what I'm saying, which is that uh, people have a very, not very positive uh, experience with education broadly and the specifically in kind of like the structures that we're working with. And I think part of the reason that us tools for thought makers focus on these very highly abstract open-ended tools is because we have all had sort of extremely bad experiences of people limiting our agency in order to achieve other people's goals and not ours. And so there's a kind of open question here of can we make these tools and environments that view 
educational structures as something that expands your agency, expands your uh, capabilities instead of limiting it. And secondly, these all these things I'm talking about people doing things together, people learning together exist within larger social structures and communities. Um, you can't separate thinking about uh, guitar or thinking about learning guitars uh, from the community of people who are making cheap music, making tabs, uh, playing music together. And it's possible that we might need uh, specific primitives for the, that community layer in order for the things you're doing on a smaller level to intersect. Um, and so broadly speaking, we're just very excited about this intersection of um, education and tools for thought. And it seems like a very exciting space to be at where a lot of things are possible right now for online learning and for people thinking together that just weren't uh, even a couple of years ago. Um, and yeah, that's all I got. Um, thanks for listening through the rant. Thanks, Jared. That was great. Very thought provoking. Um, cool. Anybody have any questions for Jared? Feel free to raise your hand or just unmute yourself. Oh, no, no, go, ahead, go, go ahead, Jeffrey. Yeah, yeah. Um, thanks. That was super thought provoking. I was curious. I found it really uh, surprising that you use learning guitar as such a central example because when I think about uh, like tools for thought, I think a lot about people trying to write or understand like history and complex domains, and I, I think less about learning a physical skill. Um, and I, I'm just curious if you could talk a bit more about, like, um, I guess, how do you see a tool like what you just showed fitting into the process of learning guitar? Um, you know, where, where, where is the role for sitting in front of a screen clicking on links in the process of learning an instrument, which I think of as like 90% of your time should be like sitting in your bedroom practicing guitar, you know? Like, how does, yeah. that, how does that interplay work for you? Absolutely. I mean, so uh, the kind of example that that example came from in my head is this phenomenon of, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Penny Beats, who is a Twitch streamer and music producer, but he has a very vibrant sort of educational community around him of uh, electronic music producers who are all these kids in their bedrooms who are making music. And it all feeds into this kind of like community space where they've he has this Twitch stream and discords. And so it's a, very, it's a very interesting example of kind of a learning community that spawned uh, in purely online spaces. And what the thread in my head there is, is essentially that uh, for most skills, right there, for to stick to the guitar example, there is that physical component of you should just be playing and you should be gaining that dexterity and that memory. But there's also a sort of social motivational context for doing everything that you want to be doing. And that is very uh, related to other people. And so some people might have that community around them and some people might not. Uh, and where the kind of like networked technology comes into play in my view is like in creating that context for doing stuff. So you're still in your bedroom practicing guitar all the time, but when you are looking to be inspired or directed into a particular direction, like what should I be playing today? Um, you have a place to go look for that uh, inspiration. And I mean inspiration in like, not a sort of general abstract sense, but also like uh, here is sort of the grounding context that tells me that if I wanna play this kind of music, I need to be studying these techniques or these chords or all these things, right? These are kind of like, I don't think any of that replaces the need to just be playing a ton of guitar, but it creates this sort of, um, yeah, motivational context for doing it, if that makes sense. Yeah, totally. Thanks. Yuri, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, it's beautiful. It's very nice. Thank you very much. I've been following your work. It's amazing. And you quite, you, Everywhere you, you were just right about all this, and the key thing is the community, is the is the is the is the ability for people to to really 
work together and mutual learning, I think, I think beautiful. So congratulations. It's, it's, this is exactly the, the, the infinite scope that I'm, I've been after all along. So that's exactly it. So I, we just had, had a write up and I, I'm sure we should be, we will talk about it a lot. Yes, I think. And the point is that I'm trying to solve this problem that you that you 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 serving with the wiki extending the wiki to actually really enable this bootstrapping this building from those primitives that's exactly it so thank you very much amazing yeah thanks go ahead Gordon hey so you raised some really good points about uh, indexing too much on primitives but my curiosity is getting the better of me so I'm gonna ask you about a primitive <laughs> I'm curious uh, you mentioned that under the hood uh, hyperlink Academy is all triple stores and I'm I'm just uh, I'm curious how you netted out on that solution and and what that's been like for you as you build that tool um so thus far it's been we're still really early days so it's totally possible that that architecture will come back to uh bias and yes down the line but thus far so the main motivation was essentially that like kind of stemming from all i've been talking about where we don't really know who the uh shapes of the specific primitives that will like uh, one one step up from the, the data structure but like the specific user facing primitives that we'll want to Give people in these educational contexts, right? There's all sorts of things that we might want to, that might turn out to be really important for building these spaces and structures. And it's very hard to know what those are in advance. And having a very atomic data model is very helpful for moving into that space slowly. Um, secondly, the that's both like, so that's from the product perspective. And then from the sort of educational perspective, there's this sense that talking about the specific attributes of all sorts of things is very useful pedagogically. So like to be able to say this document here is like, it, it, it is documenting a guitar chord. It is not text that is describing the features of a guitar chord, but it is has data named attributes that are uh, talking about it and its relationship to uh, the scales and other things. That seems like a very useful thing to have in a pedagogical environment. Um, and so that was a large motivation for it as well. Um, yeah, in terms of like the technical experience of how it's been, it's mostly made, been, it's been like, there, there are things we have to figure out in terms of like enforcing the schemas for particular attributes and talking about that whole thing and kind of uh, working with uh, the types of stuff, but having it be very granular has made working with all the data on the front end and the data is very clean. It's been a very pleasant experience thus far. Um, all that being said, it's I'm the only main dev on this right now. And so like, it is a very much like a, you know, I've lived in the space for a little bit. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's I, I think it is, I'm, I'm very bullish on the triple store kind of paradigm for these kinds of things we're dealing with. Awesome. Great question. Gordon, if you wanted to nerd out, nerd out more on architecture, Jared it could provide a lot of opportunities. You should see some of the, let's just say that he's not using the plain vanilla tech stack that most people are using. I paired with him on some stuff last week. I was It, it took me a, a little while to get my head around it before I was able to make any progress. So um, very cool. Thanks, Jared, for um, coming in and expanding our minds about educational context. That really, that is, such an important part of tools for thought that we rarely do think about is that we are actually trying to think better um and that's something that andy matushak hits on right a, a lot it's like not about using the tool better it's about thinking better and thinking better is an educational experience that's what we're all after is and a lot of it is collective and that's why we talk about real-time collaboration it's about teaching someone else something and i think like you're right that there seems to be this divide um, and I, I appreciate you highlighting that and hopefully we can start to kind of bring some of the best ideas from both domains to one another in such a way that um, each is stronger for it. So, um, so now we're going to do a couple of workplace walkthrough or workspace <laughs> workflow walkthroughs um, just by way of quick introduction. Boris is going to give a, a walkthrough in a second, but the idea here is that um, 
that as tools for thought workers, as knowledge workers, we spend a lot of time customizing our tools. Um, we try out new applications, we migrate between applications, we write little scripts that 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 stitch things together. We customize exactly what's our mint on our menu bar and what's not on our menu bar, right? Like we do all of this like customization customization of our environments, but it's really hard for me to see what's inside Gordon's environment or what's inside Gary's environment, like how he and then for beyond just seeing what's inside of it, how does he actually use it? Like when does he use a keyboard shortcut versus going and clicking on the menu bar? When does he and like how does he move between these different spaces of thinking? Um, some of you who have been in environments where you pair program a lot or pair on things a lot, you'll know that um, one of the things you pick up in that environment is you are in that experience is you pick up a lot about how other people use their environment, which is really, really cool and valuable information but we don't have that insight as knowledge workers in any kind of consistent way. So hopefully these are an opportunity to show like a little snippet of one of your workflows, the way that you do something in your environment. Um, and hopefully we can normalize these as a way of kind of a knowledge sharing of the way that we use our tools. And we can all, I think this is also really important for tool makers too, right? To have an insight into how other people use their tools. So with that long introduction, Boris. Oh, and by the way, we're gonna have these every month. I have one volunteer for September. I'd love to have two more volunteers. So um, Boris, you wanna go ahead and we'll give him about five minutes and then we'll have some, give you guys an opportunity to ask him questions about why he did certain things or like go deeper on some of the pieces that he's using, so. Uh, okay. Uh, I didn't super prep a bunch of stuff like this, um, um, but I'm, I'm happy to kind of go first um, to, to show kind of what we're thinking and encourage others. Uh, so this is LogSec, um, and I think it is important to set context of how you're using it and, 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 um, uh, and how that works. So I use LogSec currently in my current invocation um, for my like private everyday notes. I don't have to filter. I don't have to think it's a scratch pad. I might copy and paste things in there and I'm in date mode. Um, I'm a big believer, um, in, um, basically, uh, what I call a work log and, or a day log. It's been talked about a week log is another thing. Um, I'll actually grab a, a, a link to a good post about this where for my own sanity, um, I do a lot of, uh, um, <laughs> I do a lot of context switching that doesn't help my sanity. Um, so I'm a founder, uh, I help out a, a bunch of different communities in different ways. Um, I know how to code, but not really kind of on the tinker level. So I, in fact, am not doing a lot of deep work. I will often feel despondent that I'm not getting anything done, seemingly. One of the ways that I do to help my mental health is I literally will keep a granular uh, log of, oh my God, I got 18 things done today. It's not the 18 things that I thought I was going to get done, but I can look back over the day or the week and be like, okay, there's some shit happening here, which is pretty good. Um, on the... Um, uh, and I think it's really useful and I think it's an organizational tool and I've tried various things inside of companies to help individuals see that they should be doing something similar in a culture of writing and documenting and, and sharing. But the note taking piece, I think, has to be extremely personal and fit the handedness of operating system modality, mobile versus desktop and a bunch of other things like, like, like that. Um, another thing that I do a lot because I'm a talker and a community guy and an, an event organizer and so on is talk with humans a lot. Um, I would say actually um, that humans and having a Rolodex of people of knowing that uh, um, interesting people are working on interesting things is, is something that I do a lot. And what I found helpful is to merge a lot of this stuff into note taking into work log. So taking notes while I'm in a meeting um, or after I'm in a meeting um, and linking it to the individual and capturing a couple of things around the individual. So LogSec, I put in an entry for Jess. Uh, I can click on Jess um, and um, I use some primitives that I've developed on my own that are not built in that are actually cross types. Uh, I, I'm not super fancy because I've built this in lots of different systems um, with the constraints of, of each tool. Um, so in this case, I'm using a tags uh, attribute, and then in turn, having these additional tags of person. So that tells me that this is a person entity. 
I'm linking it to TFTI. I'm going to click on that one because I've actually added an alias, which I pretty, LogSec does a good job of this and does this really well. Here's the long form version. Um, I can pop back to Jess. I'm capturing his Twitter as a first class link. I spend a lot of time on Twitter. I find it's useful to do that. Um, and then uh, this bare link field of what is the what is the link that is a, a website that's associated with this person. Uh, in this case, it's his personal website. Um, and backlinks will happen, uh, and so on. And so, if I you know were to take some additional notes over here, you know, meeting with Jess. Um, I'm using the keyboard; it's auto completing for me. Um, and uh, talked about stuff. Uh, and I might say to do uh, follow up, um, send link about the thing. Um, and, uh, in reality, I actually am a lot more bare form where my raw notes are almost useless, but they're captured. Um, and I, my path, I can, I can make them more useful over time. Um, and what I will often do is make a ton of notes. Um, I'm listening to the person talk and oh yeah, send them that link to that thing from Gordon. And that will be like, what? That no one else but Boris will be able to understand what this means. But what I'll end up doing is, uh, I'll paste in the email here. Uh, I've written it anyway, why not stick it into my notes? Because I've actually done the work to try and put context in it to send it to another human. And I should, I like, it's text, I should keep it for myself. And I'm copying and pasting because we don't have a magical world where my email intertwingles into these things, obviously. Um, and then that might have, you know, um, and then I might even actually annotate my my uh, notes version and actually put in a, a something like that. Um, and then I'll just go ahead um, and make another person entry. Um, Uh, and this is just me doing my everyday tasks and linking up things and understanding that, that you know, maybe I'll even tag him with developer, which you might not want to see. He's like, I'm not really a developer. I'm a designer or whatever, but that's my <laughs> headspace for it, for, for sorts of things like that. So uh, I haven't gone in and done a bunch of other queries um, and I haven't done that yet, but that's all possible once I've done attributes and I've built various things of these roams so I can actually do a table query, which shows me all the people tagged with person. Um, and then I like have my own little mini CRM in a way that's directly related to how I work, not having to come in some other way. And I'm building up tools that have high handedness for how I operate. Uh, one more thing, here's an event. I tag it with event, it's linked back to TFTI, it has a link to the Luma and it has a date in it. Um, and so what I could actually do on the TFTI page, I could put a query in here that shows me upcoming TFTI events. Um, because I do have a development background, I think in databases, so I also know what sort of queries are actually even possible. Um, and I have a highly customized tool that works way better uh, than lots of other things for my use cases. Um, and I think that's all I have to say. This is a very basic LogSec setup that's a brand new empty one because I, I literally can't show you my personal one because it is the second brain part where it's like, you know, I'm like, Jess is an idiot or whatever I wrote the last time I talked to him or like uh, do super secret business deal with Gordon. Um, so like, I can't show you my brain. <laughs> so true. <laughs> Thanks, Boris. I think that's, Boris, you actually hit on a really interesting point, which is I think, I think one of the reasons why we don't get to see inside each other's environments very often is that exact reason, because there is, there is an element of privacy and like things left around that you may not want other people to see. Um, I mean, you can imagine anytime you invite someone into your house or like, so you know, someone's going to come over. What do you do? You walk through your house at least once and be like, anything I want to put away or pick up. Um, and it's that kind of the same idea in our, with our notes and our environments. It, a huge thing is cognitive load. Where should I put this? It's a huge thing within organizations. And, the, and if you have to also do mentally do the where should I put this and what buttons do I click so the right people can see it, um, everyone should know that this is like the words cognitive load will up your stress, it will make you unhappy, like this is, this is actually a real problem. 
um, and our you know half built, built world of broken tools that don't interoperate are not helping. That's cool. Any other questions for Boris or Rob? I saw you unmuted. Go for it. Yeah, I just want to throw in, um, yeah, that challenge of demonstrating to other people what is in your like personal knowledge base. It's very personal. Um, a while ago, I worked on this with uh, the artist formerly known as Rome Hacker, um, and on the on this like privacy mode where basically it's like because of the way that you know metadata of like the of like this link applies to everything that's indented underneath it you know like we set up a system where you could essentially write down a list just like on a config page of of uh content that you want to be like blacked out and like censored anytime that you turn this mode on you know and and, and i'd really love to see that sort of approach expand to other tools for thought um, I, we even had a special list that you could add on there where it doesn't block out all of the content. It just blocks out like the page link in particular. So like someone could say, hey, you know what? I'm okay with sharing this research. I just can't share any identifiable information. So let's just remove all the names. And then you just add all the names to that list and then it would just block out the name and it wouldn't block out all the research related to that name. You know, so I, yeah, I just really love to see that applied more broadly to other tools. Yeah, roughly, this is an unsolvable problem. And um, uh, there's some real subtle things that you want to do in here. So I have opted for private by default. Um, so I could do various things, including publish certain public fragments and so on. I believe the right default for users is private by default uh, for the vast majority of tools and that you have to take some action to make them public. For me, I would probably want tag, tags um, that uh, I could just add a public tag to stuff. Again, that's a, the handedness of you got whatever method that you're doing and so on. But if it's my tool, I'm the one who's doing the cognitive. And that's our like specialized professional worker mode, right? I still think that the public friends, family, and then there's this word group mode of Flickr from 2004 is roughly all of the privacy modes that you need. Mm -hmm. um uh like th there's a reason that they we ended up with the, with those sorts of things i think one of the challenges of that approach is um you know like or at least for for the use case that we're describing here of like just demonstrating to other people what you have in there that's a very <laughs> different bar for public versus private than like <laughs> i want to publish this versus have it private it's and then yeah it's even worse because in fact this is not the correct way to do this we're goddamn software programmers <laughs> logsec has a plugin interface if you're actually fucking serious turn your workflow into a plugin and write some documentation right right like that is the correct way of doing it but we are in the tinkerer mode which is lovely it reminds me of the early 2000s and the blogging community booting up and i think that's why we're doing this because we're like the early tinkerers and we're having lots of fun um, tools of thoughting about tools of thoughting or blogging about blogging as we used to call it, mm -hmm. which is fun. Thank you all for showing up. More, share, please. Yeah, thank you all for being here. Um, like I said, we'll have a meeting in about a month uh, in September and have a couple more interesting talks. So thanks y'all.